Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, so today's session is going to be about the business of writing. And I'm going to kind of break this into a couple of parts. And we can go back and forth and compare and contrast. But the, the two basic parts, at least when you're writing long form stuff, is do you go with a publishing company or do you self-publish? And then if you're writing shorter form stuff, there's obviously the self-publishing route, right? Those are your, your blog articles, what have you. But there is a, a, a commercial aspect to shorter form. Uh, you get, there's a lot of websites, Tom's IT, Tech Target, folks like that, who, who pay a little bit for short-term articles. Um, and then there's there's still a certain number of, of magazines uh, in the IT trade. And obviously, once you get outside of IT, all of that just kind of duplicates itself. So I wanted to kind of start with, with the book publishing model, the commercial book publishing model. And please interrupt and ask questions. Uh, otherwise, me talking for 40 minutes is going to be boring. I'll tell you a little bit about how the process works with a publisher, and I'll tell you a little bit about how the money works with a publisher. Typically, most book publishers, and this matters if you're, you're writing technology book or writing fiction or anything else, they, they pretty much all work the same. Um, most of them in, employ a, a role, a job role called an acquisition editor. And their job is to go out and get authors who are writing books. Now, in the tech world, the publishers tend to reach out proactively and try and find authors they want to write topics they want because they kind of have a catalog in mind and they're, they're looking to fill any gaps they have. So they'll go looking for someone. So if you can get in touch with one of those acquisitions editors and say, you know, hey, look, here's my areas. Um, this is what I want to write about. What do you got? Uh, they're usually pretty upfront with you. In the fiction world, obviously, there's more people writing than publishers want. And so you you wind up, I don't know if, if, if you guys are familiar with Mark Rasinovich's trilogy, but when he first felt that, when he sold the first one of those, I think he told me he got like two dozen rejection letters before he finally got accepted. So if, if you're going to write fiction, that's the world. Like if you want to go commercially published, um, those editors, those publishers tend to not have acquisitions editors. They, they have more people coming to them than they need. So they just sit back and let it roll in. Once you're in, you can kind of expect a, a few phases. The first is usually either what's called a structural edit or a developmental edit. And that's someone who's actually reading your book and look at how have you presented the narrative? Do things seem sensible? Um, does, it, does it read well? Sometimes those folks will drop into what's called a line edit where they're actually you know, making the odd typo correction or, or, or they're fixing a, a typo they run across or they're maybe looking at a, a word choice or something like that. Once you get through that phase um, and you've, you've taken their feedback and made whatever changes you're going to make, most publishers will then put you through some sort of, I'll call it peer review, a reader review. And this is where they want people to read it and give, give feedback from the field. So they might go get a dozen or so folks to submit feedback. And then you, you act on that. One of the last steps then is usually the copy edit. And that's just a pure grammar, punctuation, spelling. Um, it's, it's track changes from hell forever and ever and ever. It can be really, it can honestly be really, really tedious. A lot of times you'll find copy editors doing things like looking for echo. So if you've used the same word three times in a row in a short period of space, they're going to highlight that and ask you to come up with a new word just so it doesn't get repetitive. So there's, there's just a few things that honestly you, you can't see. You will never see about your own writing. Um, someone else reading it fresh who, who has those things in mind, they're going to see that. So all those editors add a lot of value. One thing you'll find in the, the commercial tech publishing world, at least, is uh, kind of your next phase then winds up being what they call proof pages. So they'll actually desktop produce, they'll lay out your book as it would appear in print, and then they'll send you PDFs. And you're looking for things like, you know, maybe code listings that, that they broke a line wrong or words that got hyphenated in an odd place. Um, and you might go through two or three rounds of proof pages. I will be honest with you, I've never looked at my proof pages. I, I, I just, that's a level of detail my brain can't wrap around. Um, and then like from there, you're done. That's when they actually go cut down trees and, and start printing your book. Uh, that process can take six to nine months 
Um, it's excruciatingly long, especially for a tech book where by the time you get done writing it, it's already out of date. And then they want to add another nine months of process to it. It'd be very frustrating. Um, the, the fiction writing process is about the same. Um, you're not going to get proof pages for a fiction book because you're usually not putting a bunch of code listings and, and stuff like that. It's just words. Um, and so they, they take care of all that. And then if you're writing a professional book, the other thing you need to be aware of, and this kind of starts to get into the business side of it, is the index. Um, readers still expect an index in a printed book because you can't, you can't full text search a printed book. And indexing is kind of, uh, it's kind of a specialized skill. And so you, you hire indexers or the publisher does. Um, some publishers will pay for that. Others make you pay for it. And as you start getting into the, the, the business side of this, that's where you really start having to, to be careful about what you're investing in this book. So let's talk about the business side of it. Um, let's say you buy a tech, and, and if you've got a pen here, start taking some notes because there's some math here and I'm not going to do the math in my head. It's too hard. Um, let's say you buy a tech book for 50 bucks. All right, MSRP, 50 bucks. Amazon will often sell that for about 30% off. The wholesale on that is 55% off MSRP. So whatever the cover price of the book is, more than half of it is in the toilet right to begin with. You're never gonna see a dime of that. Um, you will usually get paid a royalty of between eight and 10%. And depending on the publisher, depending on the contract, that eight, per, eight to 10% can be of the publisher's profit, meaning first they pay for the printing and the distribution and the blah, 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 blah right? Or it can be off the publisher's revenue, which is better. That means you're kind of getting comped off the top line rather than the bottom line. And that's always going to be a bigger number. So, you know, my experience, the average tech book that I write, I make a buck or two for every copy that sells. It's not much for a $50 book. So the publisher is keeping an overwhelming amount of that money. And you need to be comfortable that the publisher is doing enough to earn it. Like they're actually adding value. Do they have a mailing list that can target readers in this topical area? Um, you know, I'm, I'm writing, a, uh, well, I finished and I'm writing a sequel to a lit RPG, uh, which is a very, very specific genre. Mine is science fiction, uh, which is rare for, for lit RPG. And I, I really wanted to write lit RPG because I found a few books I like and I wanted to write in that genre. And I knew I didn't know how to reach those readers. And Amazon, um, Kindle Unlimited is full of this stuff, full of it. And a lot of it's crap. It was really hard to cut through that noise. So I decided I wanted to go with a publisher. And I started talking to publishers like, yeah, we'd love to publish. I'm like, well, well slow down. Like, I get that you're going to keep 90% and I'm going to get 10%. But like, tell me about your mailing list. Do you go to book fairs? What, what do you do to promote this? And that's the value they're supposed to be adding, not just bringing a copy editor. Um, a lot of them will go on and on about, oh, you know, we'll pay for the copy editor. Let me tell you something. I pay for a proofreader for my which kind books, right? Those are completely independent. Those are 60 to 70,000 words. And the most I've ever been charged to proofread one of those books is 250 bucks. So if a publisher is going on and on and on about how, oh, we're going to get you a copy editor, that's not worth that much in dollars, right? It'd be like, you know what? I'll pay for the copy editor and you give me another 20% in royalties. How about that? So be aware of the costs of what the publisher is providing. They're saying, oh, we do lots of marketing. Cool, what? Are you gonna get me on podcasts in this audience? Like show me some of the marketing you've done for your other authors. Um, if it's, oh, you know, we rep, we rep Stephen King. Yeah, that's cool, but I'm not Stephen King, right? Stephen King doesn't even need to market books. He just needs to go in the bathroom and shit one out and everyone will buy a copy. It'll be on the New York Times bestseller list and, and no one cares. So like, what are you gonna do for me? Those are all important questions to ask if you're gonna get into a, that kind of commercial relationship. Um, there's a, a thing called advance against royalties. What that means is they're gonna give you a cash payment up front, and then your royalties pay off that loan. And once the loan is paid off, you start getting more royalty checks. Um, some publishers are, are okay about 
eating it if the book never earns back its advance. Some publishers will come after you for the money. Um, I do not take advances anymore. Uh, I try not to write books unless I think they're going to be successful and I don't want an advance. If you don't take an advance, you can usually negotiate a higher royalty. I've gotten 12%, I've gotten 15% in the past by not taking an advance because I'm taking more risk and the publisher knows they're not going to be cash out of pocket. Um, and so if I'm taking more risk on the deal, then I should have more of the reward should it go well. So that's kind of the, the commercial publishing world. Um, it, it's, it's pretty cutthroat. There's a lot of players. Your publisher is going to order books to be printed in China, and they're going to come over on a giant, uh, a giant container. Um, those are going to be warehoused somewhere, and they usually pay someone else to do that. There's a couple of large distribution companies. Ingram Micro is one of them, or Ingram. Um, they charge money for that. Those two publishers, or sorry, those two distributors, those two big distributors, Ingram and whoever the other one is, they're the ones who actually ship to bookstores, to Amazon. Like nobody deals directly with the publisher. It's kind of like alcohol. Nobody buys directly from the distillery. It all has to go through a distribution system before it winds up in a store, before you can go buy it. Books look a lot like that. It's a really screwed up industry in a lot of ways. Um, Ebooks should have made it a lot better and they didn't. Um, everybody just kind of adopted the same model. It's still a pretty screwed up model. Um, this soft skills book I'm writing from Anning that I finished, I finished that back in November and it's still not out yet, is it? And that tells you how long publishers can take to do things. Um, it can be very, very time consuming. So let's talk about the, the world of self-publishing for long form content. Uh, you can obviously write whatever you want. Uh, I do recommend you have some beta readers so if you're writing a tech book, get some people who would be in the audience and ask them to be your beta reader. Um, kick them a gift card on Amazon at the end to, to thank them for it. Uh, I recommend a copy editor, strongly recommend a copy editor, a good copy editor. And most copy editors will expect an audition. So you can ship them a thousand words and say, you know, look, I just want you to mark this up. Uh, and, and if it goes well, and then you can go back and look like, okay, you missed three. No copy editor is going to catch everything. Um, the copy editor, Emma, who does my Witchkind books, I love her. She's fantastic. She's wonderful to work with. One of my, my beta readers, Jim Top, is also really, really detailed about grammar and punctuation and spelling. And after Emma's done, he sends me his list that he came up with. And he got 26 points last time. Out of a 74,000 word book, he picked up 26 corrections that my copy editor missed. It happens. So in the world of self-publishing, I, as you know, probably have written on leanpub.com. Um, I love their platform. You write in Markdown, you can put your books in GitHub. It's source controlled. Uh, your collaborators can file issues against chapters, right? It, it's, it's just awesome. And then their system picks that up out of GitHub and makes it into an attractive PDF, an EPUB, and a Mobi. And then you can sell directly through them. Uh, they don't own any of the rights. You can publish through them and put your book elsewhere. You can still put your book in Amazon, for example. Amazon is obviously where the money's at, right? If you're writing something and you want it to reach the mass market, everybody kind of expects it to be in Amazon. Um, Amazon accounts for something like 90% of ebook sales. So, I mean, to a point, you can safely ignore every other ebook platform. Um, you are going to lose some readers that way, but it's going to be it's going to be one in ten, right? Uh, if you publish in Amazon, you're going to be going through a program called Kindle Direct Publishing or KDP. They can also do paperbacks for you, and and quite honestly, their paperbacks are amongst the most reasonably priced. Um, I also do paperbacks through Ingram Micro, or sorry, Ingram Spark. So that's Ingram's self-publishing portal, and I'll tell you why. Even though you can publish a paperback through Amazon, and they give you an ISBN, and, and they, can, they have an option you can check for expanded distribution, they will sell at wholesale your paperback to bookstores. Zero bookstores will buy a paperback from Amazon. None. They just will not do it. Because it's like Amazon is trying to kill them. So they're not going to empower Amazon. That's why I also publish my paperbacks through Ingram. I get a separate ISBN for them. It's, it's the same manuscript. It's the same PDF. 
you have to tweak the cover a bit because the, their page count, uh, their pages are actually microscopically thicker. So it adds up to a slightly thicker book. So you have to do your cover art twice. Um, but that's so that, that bookstores, if they want to carry my book, feel good about it. Ingram charges me more to print those books than Amazon does. So I actually make less money that way. Um, it's not a lot. It's like a dollar a book, but you know, it adds up. Uh, Amazon has a program called Kindle Unlimited, and I'm sure a lot of you are aware of it. Um, readers can pay a monthly fee for unlimited access to everything that's in the Kindle Unlimited library. They can have 10 books on their Kindle at once, and when they're done, they return it and they can get another one. Um, there's also a feature of the Kindle devices called the, the KOLL, the Kindle Owner's Lending Library. And it works a lot like Kindle Unlimited, except it's a smaller selection of books. You can borrow the book from the library, read it, and give it back when you're done. And it's included. You, know, you don't pay for that. It's just part of having a Kindle. Um, I think you might have to be a Prime subscriber, but I assume everyone on planet Earth is a Prime subscriber at this point. As an author, here's what here's how here's how Amazon pays you for ebooks published through their platform. Um, if someone buys the ebook, just buys it. You set the price on it, and so you know up front how you're how much you're going to make. Um, I think you know if you set the book to be three ninety nine, you make like two bucks on the sale or something like that. Amazon keeps the rest. It's not a bad deal. Uh, they let you have a seventy thirty split. So if you know if you set the price, you keep seventy percent. They keep thirty percent. It's like the Apple App Store. Most other ebook platforms do that too. Um, if you are publishing through Apple Books, it's seventy thirty split. Kobo seventy thirty split. Barnes & Noble, Nook, 70-30 split. If you want to do wide distribution, in other words, if you want your ebook to be in all of those platforms, don't go through Kindle Direct Publishing. Instead, go with a company called draft2digital.com. Um, they're super easy to work with. They will distribute out to all those platforms and they will get all your royalties back to you in one check. Nice and easy. But however, if you want access to that enormous audience of Kindle Unlimited readers, then you have to go through Kindle Direct Publishing. And when you do, you have to opt into a program called Kindle Select. And that gets you into the Kindle Owner's Lending Library. It gets you into Kindle Unlimited. And you must be exclusive to Amazon for your ebook. You can still do a paperback wherever you want to, but you cannot sell your ebook through any other channels. And that's a 90 day commitment and it auto renews. So if you don't want it to renew at some point, you have to go uncheck that checkbox, wait until that period ends. And then you can go into a wider distribution. Here's how you get paid on those. Amazon calculates, they, they, they have a, an algorithm called the Kindle edition normalized page. And basically what they do is they, they work out how many words fit on a nominal page font sizes, it's the same number of words per normalized page. Let's say it's 600. When a reader downloads your book through Kindle Unlimited or the KOLL, every time they turn the page, in other words, every time they have, they have turned a normalized page, so let's say they, they've jacked their font size up huge, they might have to actually turn the page four times to create one normalized page turn. That's what you get paid on. The first time a reader reads a normalized page, you get a few cents or a few fractions of a cent. If they go back later and read it again, you don't get paid, right? It's intended that the first time through you get paid. And after that, it's just like they bought the book. And if they read it again, well, I mean, you don't, get, you don't get paid a second time if someone reads your book twice, right? That's how it works. If they read half the book, that's how much money you make. If they read two pages, you made a couple cents and that's it. Oh, good Lord. Sorry, that was my dog. Each period, each quarter, they announce how much money is in the Kindle Global Fund. And that's essentially a certain amount of prime subscription money getting put into a dumpster for the KOLL and then all the revenue from the Kindle Unlimited subscribers. So the more people that are subscribing to Kindle Unlimited, the bigger that pool is, it's a dumpster of money. And then for each period, they look at the total number of normalized page views across all authors. 
and they figure out, okay, each page view is worth this much of the dumpster. And then you get, you get yours, you get your percentage of that. Uh, there are authors out there who are, are making bank. They're making five, six hundred thousand dollars a year on that, primarily in the romance genre. Um, but that's how it works. Um, I've kind of adopted a strategy of, of releasing in Kindle Unlimited for the first 90 days. So I do one period and then I uncheck the checkbox and then I go wide. So I can pick up a few extra subscribers here and there. Um, if, if, you, if you've got a reader base that is gonna jump and read your book when it comes out, then you'll pick them up from Kindle Unlimited that way. And then your Kindle Unlimited, if you do this for a while, you, they've got charts and graphs and everything else. You can see your Kindle Unlimited earnings for a single book tail off. And when they tail off, that's the time to turn off the checkbox and go wide. Cause then you can pick up a few more subscribers on other platforms. So that's kind of the broad bit about it. Now, look, when you're, when you're self-publishing, you are your marketer, your salesperson, you are the everything. So you have to be in for that. You have to be okay for that. Um, you have to decide if you're going to do advertising, if you're going to do Amazon advertising, if you're going to do Facebook advertising. Um, there's a lot of techniques to it. For example, you know, building your newsletter is a huge deal. So you're going to have to subscribe to MailChimp or something like that. Um, one way you get readers to sign up is through something called a reader magnet which might be a free sample of your book or maybe a short story that's free or a collection of short stories that you wrote specifically for that purpose to kind of attract people in. Um, if in the technical world, you can do the same thing with, with samples or shorter pieces to try and go, oh yeah, you know, I really like his writing. I'm, I'm gonna sign up for his newsletter and maybe buy a couple of his books. Um, there are websites you can go to to connect with other authors in your genre and you can do newsletter swaps. You know, you mentioned my sign up thing and I'll mention your sign up thing and we'll, we'll help each other out a little bit that way. You become your marketing person and there's websites and tools for all these things. Some costs, some are free, um, but, but that's the world of self-publishing is, is you are the publisher, the manager, the marketer, the advertiser, the writer, you're the everything. Uh, so those, that's, that's kind of the broad of the book publishing world. And I kind of want to stop there and, and hope, that, hope that some questions have arisen. Oh, Doug, you're talking about the uh, Ingram Spark, I'm talking about a slightly thicker book. But you're talking about the front and back matter? No, um, the cover itself, the actual cover art that I have to do. So, so when I when I publish my my book, take the which kind of books, um, Scrivener, which I showed you guys last week, produces the PDF that's called the book block. That's the manuscript. So I know how many pages my manuscript is and I've got the trim size. When I take that to Kindle, they've got a little template generator and you tell it, uh, this is how many pages and it makes a template for your cover art because your cover art is wraparound, meaning you have one image that's the front, the spine and the back. And it's okay. based on the thickness of the pages. Ingram's pages are slightly thicker. So when you use their template generator, the image, the spine of the image is a little bit larger because of that, that, that additive extra page thickness. So I, I pay a cover designer and I actually have to pay him twice. I have to pay him to do the same cover because calculating that spine down to the micron is really, really painstaking. So he has to do two separate covers that look identical except one is slightly thicker than the other. Um, the other thing you have to be aware of is ISBNs. Uh, ISBNs are locked into a, a very particular thing. So if you have, if you've done a book in Kindle, direct publishing, a paperback, they will give you a free ISBN from their supply. But if you go to Ingram, you have to have a second ISBN for the same book that just because it's going through different distribution. So there's a company called Bowker, B-O-W-K-E-R that sells ISBNs. Um, you can go to a website called myidentifiers.com and you can buy one or a batch of 10 or they're not expensive. I bought like a batch of a hundred because it was, I don't know, 110 bucks or something like that. And I figured that'll hold me for a long time. Um, Ebooks typically don't require an ISBN um, unless you're going into wide distribution. Some do. Kobo requires an ISBN. So you have to have another ISBN for that. Um, so it, it can add up like your audiobook might be a separate ISBN. Like if you had a large print edition, that would be a separate ISBN. 
Um, so they, you know, you burn through them pretty quick if you're doing a lot of publishing. Well, uh, John, the uh, just question on the, you said the, a couple of places that, uh, that pay a little bit for uh, articles. Was that Tom's IT and Tech Target? Yeah, so let's, let's get onto the short form side. Um, any of what I call your clickbait websites, where why they really want you there is A, to look at ads and B, to sign up so that you can read their premium content, even if it's free. Um, they want your name. They want you on a mailing list. Uh, those folks will usually pay. Uh, and it might be 75 or 100 bucks for a five to 800 word piece, which is a very short blog article size. Um, Tech Target is one. Tech Target is the company that runs searchwindows.com and search SQL server.com and, and search data intelligence.com and search blah, 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 dot com. They've got an infinite number of those things. And they live on just a constant stream of content. Um, I did deals for a while where they would, they would put me on a one-year agreement and they're like, we want one 800 word article on SQL server per month. And I'm like, fantastic. I would sit down, write 12 of them. Here you go. And then I've got, you know, a hundred bucks coming in every month. And it's like, not much, but if you're doing 12 of those deals, then it starts to add up. And that's how I made, made that a, a real part of my full-time writing gig. Um, Tom's IT is another one. Um, uh, Petri.co, Petri.co was another one. I don't know if they still do. I think they still do. Um, you can poke Jeff Hicks on the social medias because he does a lot of that type of work. Um, Adam Bertram has done a lot of that type of work as well. A, a lot of us who are, are more or less professional writers or have been, um, that's an important part of it. Um, Redmond Magazine, you know, you get into some of your IT magazines. They do the same thing. Um, they tend to put more content into their electronic editions than their print editions. So it's a little easier to get a recurring column in the electronic edition. The print edition is obviously pretty, pretty precious because it's expensive to produce. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are, those are all places to look at short form. Okay. And that's, that's what you're looking. You're looking at, you know, a hundred bucks an article these days. What do you think are the benefits, pitfalls versus self-publishing and going to a publisher? What's your preference? You like for longer form content? What's your preference? Uh, it's hard to tell. I am um, like my PowerShell month of lunches book would never have been successful had it not been published through a traditional. Just a fact. Um, it's probably sold 10, 15,000 copies, and that never would have happened on its own. To contrast that, the PowerShell scripting and tool making book, Jeff, uh, book that Jeff and I have on LeanPub has sold maybe, maybe a thousand copies. Now, on the other hand, we get to keep all the money. So that's nice. Um, it, it depends a little on what your goals are. You know, um, that month of lunches book, I might have only made a buck a piece, but it drove people to ask me to teach classes. It drove getting conference speaking gigs. It drove creating PowerShell.org and the PowerShell Summit. Like, like that book did a lot beyond just its money. And it wouldn't have done all that if there hadn't have been a publisher behind it. Um, just because they've got, they do have a lot of marketing reach and they're, they're pretty good at using it. Uh, not all publishers are, but they are. Um, on the other hand, I, I hate the process. I hate how long it takes. I hate everybody sticking their fingers in your book who thinks they're adding value who aren't. Um, they're just adding time. So I like self-publishing a lot in that respect. Um, I've mentioned that, that I have an agent interested in repping the, the which kind books. And so I'm having a, a structural edit done on the first hundred pages of the first book. And that's in an attempt to put it into the best possible shape so she can shop it around to publishers and the publisher will insist on like, okay, you may have self-published this, but that doesn't mean it's done. We're going to do a structural edit and we're going to have our own copy editor to look at it. And that, I'm sure that'll take six to nine months. But, but like, that's the process. And look, if, a, you know, it, if I sold a thousand copies of that book on my own, that novel, I'd be delighted. Um, 
a publisher is going to want to sell a hundred thousand copies and get a movie deal, right? So it's it's scale. Um, people do self publish, and and they do well at it, and it's becoming more and more and more and more and more common. But if you don't already have a following, like if you don't already have nineteen thousand people on Twitter to buy your book, you can't just toss a book into Amazon and assume anyone will ever even find it. Um, it took a lot of work for me to get to the point where typing Daniel Scratch in Amazon actually brought up my book somewhere on the first page. It took a lot of work. I had to beg for reviews. I had to get a certain number of sales. Like Amazon ignores you unless, unless you're making them money, which is what it's all about, right? So until it started to, to gather, and that was just a ton of manual effort, I still have to do that. Like every time I put out a new book, I have to go through that process because otherwise Amazon just buries it. So, you know, publishers have a little bit more, more oomph. Um, Amazon is a little bit more confident that a publisher who's done well with other books will do well with your book. And so right away you type PowerShell and my book is one of the first ones that shows up. So, you know, you kind of have to figure out what, what you want. Publishers can bring something to the table. Well, I will say thank you for the PowerShell book because that launched the industry. You and Don. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm real happy with that one. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little sad because I decided when Windows PowerShell stopped being a thing um, that I wasn't going to move the book forward. And that's why there's another edition being done by other people. Um, I just I just don't have the time anymore. But I am I'm really, really happy that that's out there. It's one of the obviously the highlights of my career. And, and I'm real proud of it. So anything else on the on the business of publishing? Uh, the, the questions my wife gave me, you answered just about every one of them and more. Good. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, if, if you're talking about writing a technical book and you think you can write a 300 word book, because because under a certain size book uh, financially just doesn't make sense. You need to be in the 300 page range, ideally. and if you think you can do that and you think you can knuckle down and do it on a schedule, like if you can do the outline, if you can commit to writing twice a week or whatever it is, honestly, most publishers will work with your schedule. What happens is most authors go in, they write two chapters, they get the markups back from their editors and they're like, screw this crap, I don't wanna do it anymore. And then they just, they bail or they, or, or life happens, like they, they realize they overcommitted and they haven't seen their kids and so they stop writing. Most, most tech books that get commissioned don't ever get published because the authors flake out. But if you cannot be a, a serial flake in writing the book, a lot of tech publishers will work with you. They struggle to get people who can write well and write on schedule. Um, they struggle to get people who can just get the work done. If you're good at outlining, and you, you work on your storytelling and you write something compelling, then it's gonna do well. And the publisher will work with you and you'll make some money. Um, books take a lot of effort the first time and the second and third and fourth and fifth, they take a lot of effort. And you can't, like one book is not gonna pay your mortgage. You, you like gotta grasp that. Um, the PowerShell book, made a few mortgage payments, but it did not do so constantly. And it was probably like the 30 or 40th book I had ever written. So if, if it's going to be a business for you, then you need to make it a business. You, you know, businesses don't produce one hamburger and then shut down. You gotta keep making hamburgers over and over and over and over and over. You gotta do it all the time. Short form, long form, all the forms, all the time. Another thing people use books for is a business card. You know, it's, hey, I wrote a book on this. I'm a subject matter expert in this. The book has done reasonably well. Um, hire me to speak at your conference. Hire me to work for your company. Hire me to consult. Hire me to teach a class, right? That's what people use books for a lot in the tech industry is, is the, the, the cachet of having done so. So I think that's the other thing to think about is if you want to do writing commercially, you need to look at what your business is. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't have a business, I, I'm employed, then you're wrong. You get paid by, by someone, your employer is paying you. Therefore, you are a business. 
and you are providing a service or product to someone who is paying you for it. And if that service is you showing up every day and doing certain things, then, then fine, but you're still a business. You need to look at how writing fits into your business, either the one you have now or one you want to build for yourself. And no business only sells one thing, right? McDonald's has got chicken nuggets and hamburgers and fries and shakes and coffee and desserts and all that other crap. All businesses have to be well-rounded um, because you've, you know, there's lots of different aspects to any industry and you need to kind of hit the ones that make sense for you so that you can have a well-rounded business. Um, you know, Greg Shields and I, when we had concentrated tech, we wrote a ton of white papers for companies that they would use as marketing assets. But you can't only do that because something's going to happen like a recession and companies are going to want to stop paying for the white papers. You've got to have another thing going on too. So you've got to have a lot. We did video training with CBT Nuggets, right? We wrote books. I, I did most of our writing because I'm, I'm faster at it than Greg. Greg does most, did most of our, our webinars and video training because he's faster at that than me. So you got to like, what am I good at? What am I bad at? I don't want to do too much of what I'm bad at, but I might need to do a little of it. And I need to really focus on the stuff I'm good at, but it's got to be a well-rounded business. Um, you know, all kinds of writing need to be a part of that. Your blog has to be a part of it because even if, even if you're a fiction writer, because people need to be able to come see you more regularly than just every time you put out a book. Right. If the only time they see you is every third Christmas, then they're going to forget about you. So they've got to have something to touch base and stay connected with you the whole time. Um, so it is a business and you really got to think about it. Unless you're writing romance, apparently, if you can just crank out a romance novel once a month, then you're, you'll be rich as near as I can tell. Well, she's got six of them. So. And, and honest to God, the, the the people who are good in that that space i've, I've spoken with several of them and th and they think about it so much like a business and i respect that so much it's you know a, a, a typical novel like a normal novel is around a hundred thousand words give or take um obviously you know harry potter is eight hundred thousand million words whatever but a hundred thousand words is a novel a lot of the folks in romance do not do paperbacks they just don't anymore um they will do a 50,000 word novel because they can crank one of those out every four weeks. So they're doing 12 of these a year. And what they're relying on is somebody running across the top of their funnel, their first book, which will have two or 300 positive reviews and a lot of sales. And so Amazon really amps it to sell it to more people. And then you look at, okay, 99% of those are going to buy the second book. And 90% of those are going to buy the third book. And you just, you want to binge read. It's literally the Netflix model because these people are on Kindle Unlimited, the readers, and they're paying a fixed monthly fee. So you just want them binging every single one of your books all the way through beginning to end so that you're picking up those normalized page views. And that's where the money comes from. And they don't go wide. They stick solely with Kindle Unlimited because there's a built-in mega audience there that will just do book, 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 read, 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 read. And it's like, it's a huge business. And if you can make a name for yourself in your, like if you have your little, your little twist on it and you've, you've accumulated your audience around it, that genre, and there's another genre that does exactly as well. It's called the cozy mystery. I don't know if you guys know what that is. I didn't, I had to look it up. Do you remember Murder, She Wrote with Angela Lansbury? That's a cozy mystery. It's not scary. Nobody really dies. Like if someone died, it was in another room and you never see them. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's a little cute little old lady going around and finding stuff that the town cop couldn't figure out. That's a cozy mystery. It's an entire genre and people read the living shit out of it. They love it. Um, if I could write that, I, I, would just, I would just do that. Sadly, I can't, so much respect to the people who do you know but that's another thing is if book writing or, or any kind of writing is a business who's your customer who are you writing for uh, if you're like you know what i'm going to do a blog on amazon web services um elastic block storage that seems pretty niche I'm not sure how many people are going to going to read all that. So like really look at where's their demand. Um, 
I'll give you two examples from that from the tech industry. Back in, in 2002, I had been, yeah, for probably for three or four years at that point, I had been writing books on anything the publisher would pay me to do. Application center, on it. Commerce server, sure. SQL server, fine. PHP, great. Didn't care. Was living off the advances. Hey, you want to write e-commerce for dummies? You bet your ass I do. What's that pay? And that's it's fine, but I wasn't really looking at, at where the, the audience was. I realized I needed to, to, to center on an audience. And so I, I, I stopped and Chris and I sat and we looked at the opportunity. And at the time, this is late 2002, early 2003, VB script was starting to really hit Windows administrators. They were starting to figure out it was there. They were seeing articles in TechNet Magazine, there were online articles, but no one was really teaching it to a Windows admin. Everybody was teaching basic programming classes and the admins weren't latching onto it. So I decided I was gonna own that space. And, and that was one of the first successful, really successful books I ever wrote that very much earned out uh, its, its advance. And that was my managing Windows with VBScript and WMI book. PowerShell was an actual follow on to that. I didn't get into PowerShell because I identified PowerShell. I was already in VB script. I already had that automating administration audience. And I was the only one speaking to them at the time. And so I, I, I started to amass a big following and they all followed me to PowerShell. We all made that jump to PowerShell. Um, so like, look where there's a need, look where people aren't being served well. And if it's, you know, topic A, God, there are 80 people have written a book on it, but none of them are really talking to a beginner. You know, I, great example. It's hard to find a good beginning book on networking. It is hard to find a book that explains how to subnet and you still have to sub that. Like you still have to know how to do that. It's still the thing in the world because everybody's moved on and they assume it's already been written. So look for an audience that needs served Estimate the size of that audience and decide if that's what's going, you know, worth going after for you. Do I have any experience with packet publishing? Oh boy. Um, yeah, they're kind of the. I, so I'll say this: I I know a lot of people have had extremely positive experiences with packet publishing. I have not worked for them. I know a lot of people who have very poor experiences with packet publishing. They've spoken to me a few times, and my takeaway, my impression, along with the bad stories I've heard about them, are that they're the puppy mill of the IT book publishing world. And it's just, they grind through authors to get the books out there. And look, I mean, that's a business model. I don't, I don't fault them for that. Um, it's not where I would be. I am not sure I would want to look and see how many of their authors have gone on to bigger and better things. How many of their authors were able to leverage that book into whatever else they were doing. Um, it's fine to work with a mercenary publishing company if you are getting what you want out of it. Um, I think a lot of people go into book tech book publishing just wanting to write a book so they can say they wrote a book because it's a big deal. And it's easy for a publisher to capitalize on that. And if you don't know what you're getting out of it, you're not going to get a lot out of it. All right. Anything else? What else? Oh, okay. All right. Well, with that, I think we have, do we have one more of these set up after this? I need to check my notes. Uh, we've got two more after this. So the next session is going to be on storytelling. And this is a, this is a big deal. Uh, it's a really big deal. Um, in fact, because this is going to go up, yeah, our next session is, is going to have to be in April. So, you know, if you haven't, if you're, if you're watching this on YouTube and you're watching it in, in March of, uh, whenever we are 2021, go to whichkind.com and sign up for the newsletter. The next one's going to go out on the 1st of April, 2021. And it's got the link so you can join the last two of these writing workshops. The storytelling one is, is a big deal. Whether you're writing academic, tech, fiction, it doesn't matter. It is storytelling. And I think, I think 
everybody has over marketed the word storytelling so much that everyone thinks it's it's bullshit, but it's legit not. And I'm I'm really going to dig into it and walk you through it. Um, you need to approach everything you write, even if it's a one paragraph email. You you are trying to tell a story to someone and win them over or or communicate something. This is like the key of written communication. So that's our next session. Um, and then the last one after that is going to be how people learn and enjoy. Um, things that you can do to better understand how people's brains ingest information, how you can start to engage a little bit of instructional design, even if you're writing fiction, um, how some of those other soft skills can come into play. And then uh, I'll give you some recommendations for some books and, and stuff along those lines as well. Um, so those will be our last two. I think, it's, and do we have another weekend in March? I've still lost track of this month. No, so it, it looks like it'll be April 3rd for the next one. And then probably April 10th for the last one after that. Cool. All right, well, everyone have a, a very lovely uh, rest of your weekend. And I will hopefully see you next time. Tell a friend. Thank you, Don.